Well, we've spent the past couple of weeks during the Easter season now exploring how our human understanding of the life and teachings of Jesus have been evolving over time and how we can see some of the most profound changes in just that short 40 or 45 year span between the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of John. Um, you might recall that Mark, the oldest, gives us a demon-haunted world where the divine origin of Jesus starts when he's baptized and then the story ends with simply an empty tomb. That's it. In Mark, Jesus casts out a whole bunch of demons and then talks about how the world is soon coming to an end and how it was going to happen within the lifetime of the people who were listening to him. Things have become bad. How bad were they? <laughs> they have become so bad that the essential, the essential justice and goodness of God required that God intervene and take control of things. And uh, we can see this all laid out in chapter 13 of Mark. Here's a, here's a few excerpts just to give you a gist of what he was talking about. If you haven't read these before, it's good to see these. Okay, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but <laughs> the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. Whoa. Next one. Oh, here. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. How is it the family values crowd uh, <laughs> missed this somewhere along the line? It has nothing to say about this kind of stuff. Isn't that? That's awful. And you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Next one. For in those days there will be suffering such has not been seen... Such as, such as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now. He, he forgot about that flood, I guess. But uh, <laughs> has not been seen from the beginning of the creation that God has created until now. No, and never will be. All right, more cheerful news. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from the heaven. And the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. That's a miserable piece of work, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. and, and the interesting thing is that people then... And people still today listen to that and think, hey, sounds great, bring it on, right? You hear about people that really think this is going to happen and they're waiting for it and they're welcoming it. And usually I think it's because just about everybody who listens to this are pretty well convinced that the bad stuff is going to happen to the other guy, right? I'm going to be one of those who endures until the end and be saved. And, uh, and, and, of course, Luke and Matthew, they have very much the same thing. I won't depress you further with the details, um, they, they, except, except they add some more lovely parts about how the people who are not part of the elect are going to be cast into a lake of fire for all eternity. That's their, their addition to this whole narrative. So that's some pretty ugly stuff. And fortunately, none of that has happened. Now, that's Mark. That's Luke. That's Matthew. 40 to 45 years later, by the time we get to John, we hear this completely different story. Totally different. No demons, no army of angels, no lake of fire, no condemnation, no stories of darkness and suffering. Instead, the word that we hear used most often in John is that four-letter word, love. Love shows up in John twice as much as in any other gospel. Something happened. Something happened, and it happened in this community of people where the Gospel of John must have originated. There was a community 
somewhere that had come to follow a different version or a different vision, perhaps, of the life and the teachings of Jesus. This community knew Jesus as the embodiment of the highest form of love that they could imagine. They experienced him as the embodiment of wisdom, as the embodiment of the principle of reason that gives order to the universe. He wasn't a warrior. He wasn't some warrior savior who was coming to usher in the end times. He was a living example of divinity in human form to these people. The word this community used for that divinity was logos. That was our topic last week. Jesus was the divine logos, the, the ordering principle of the universe. And the very fact that they used the word logos meant that they were pretty well versed in Greek and Roman philosophy because logos is a, is a Greek term. And now we're starting to see this really interesting blending of cultures. Not multiculturalism, but pluralism, where, where ideas come from different cultures, they live side by side for a while, then they start to blend into something that's a little bit different, and it's greater than just the sum total of their parts. That's what we're getting here. Jesus, the divine Logos, was a much more expansive idea than simply a Jewish Messiah figure. He became a role model for living. The teachings of Jesus had become this, this dynamic philosophy for this community, a philosophy of, of living rather than a, a passive belief system where you know, we all just sit around and wait for the apocalypse, the end times, and that kind of thing. A person living in that community would be regarded as wise and loving based on how they lived, not what they believed, not where they went to school, and things like that. No more talk of incessant strife and suffering. I mean, there was plenty of that to go around, but that's not the focus. They were still persecuted, and life in those days was still harsh, but they didn't focus on it. In John, we get another message about what's supposed to happen. We get this passage here, where he said, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. What a reversal. Mm -hmm. It's a 180. 40 years. Despite all the hardship and oppression that was still going on, the message here is that life is better when you live it according to the principles of wisdom and love that Jesus, the divine Logos, represented to this group. Forget about the end times. Start living right now. Start living now, really living. All of the talk about Jesus being the Son of God simply meant that he was God-like to the people who encountered him. And it was not an exclusive thing, certainly not in John. It was something that everyone was able to aspire to, which is a fact that Jesus himself acknowledged in a passage from John where he said this, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If those to whom the word of God came were called gods, and the scripture cannot be annulled, can you say that the one whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world is blaspheming because I said, I am God's son? Now that kind of talk, I think, would have been familiar to the people living in ancient Greece and Roman areas back in that day. Because according to ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, joy and happiness were worthy goals for human beings to aspire to. And being godlike was also something that you could aspire to and become. Now, here, here's a passage from the writings of the Roman philosopher Seneca, who died in the year 65 AD. So this stuff would have been circulating during the same time. He starts out with a question. What is the happy life? It is peace of mind and lasting tranquility. This will be yours if you possess greatness of soul. Well, how do you reach this condition? By gaining a complete view of truth, by maintaining order, measure, fitness, and a will that is inoffensive and kindly. 
that is intent upon reason and never departs therefrom, that commands at the same time love and admiration. In short, to give you the principle and brief compass, the wise man's soul ought to be such as would be proper for a god. An invitation to live a happy life and be more godlike. This kind of thinking was part of Roman culture, so it's no wonder that the teachings of Jesus really took root in places that were closer to Rome and Greece than Israel. So for many years, these communities and, and the, of, of, of his followers found ways to, to thrive even in the midst of the ongoing chaos around them. Conditions for the early followers of Jesus really depended on who the Roman emperor was. Persecution would increase and decrease according to who was in power for over 200 years. But still, these communities survived and even thrived. Adversity brought out the best in them. It's too bad it has to be that way, but I, I think that's a part of the human condition. And the sad truth is that things started to change for the worse as soon as a Roman emperor came along who gave his official stamp of approval to Christianity. Constantine, he made it okay to be a Christian. Most of the persecution stopped, and then everything started changing beyond recognition. Instead of coming together in supportive communities where they celebrated love and wisdom and looked for ways to live a happy and joy-filled life, they started arguing over ideology. They started arguing over what was the proper and orthodox way to be a follower of Jesus. Now, it's, it's good to have a few rules. I won't argue with anyone on that point. It's good to have a few rules, but now that Christianity gets linked to the Roman Empire, now that Constantine says, yeah, it's okay, there's this temptation at that point to make a power grab. Irresistible temptation. There you have the wealth and the power and the extensive reach of the Roman Empire, and you could set up a religious system that would piggyback on that, that would wield the wealth and the power of the Roman Empire. Wow. The institution becomes the dominant force which explains why the various rites and rituals of the early church look so much like what went on in the Roman imperial court, and still does today in some churches. Form became all important. The substance was lost. The persecuted became the persecutors. Crusades, inquisitions, Witch hunts, Calvinism, manifest destiny, not much joy in any of those things, and they went on for centuries. But you see, there was one thing that never changed. The core ideas are still there for everyone to see. They're still there. They're still intact in places and, and, and pockets here and there. There were some people who remembered that substance is more important than form that the real goal of the life and teachings of Jesus is to establish these communities that celebrate joy and love and personal transformation. Don't let the term godlike throw you off. It's about personal transformation. But it takes work. That's what it comes down to. It takes work, which is why we're all here this morning, instead of enjoying another cup of coffee on the patio or reading the Sunday paper or, you know, whatever it is, we love the ideas, or in the words that we heard from Seneca, we want to study truth and cultivate a will that is inoffensive and kindly. We want that wise soul that would be such as is proper for a God. It's the work of a lifetime. And whenever we think that we've won, when we think that we've seen the last obstacle, that our, that our work is done, well, that's when the trouble begins. And Emperor Constantine can take so many forms, symbolically. It's the voice that says, I'll take care of everything. You don't have to lift a finger. I'll, I'll give it to you. A touch of my hand, I'll pour it into your head. Because you, my friend, have arrived. Sit back, 
Enjoy the spectacle. Be entertained. I had a wise Zen Buddhist teacher once who told the story about how he was leading a group of students on a meditation weekend retreat in this run-down, dilapidated uh, part of a major urban area. I think it was somewhere in Texas. The building they were in was rat-infested. So one day, during a break, they were outside in this little, this little courtyard, and they noticed that a local cat had, uh, had a rat cornered in a small sapling. And it's probably not the right term. You can't corner something in a tree, but we had a tree, I guess, is what we want to say. And, and this was a sapling. It was too flimsy for the cat to climb, but it was tall enough for the rat to get up there out of the way so the cat couldn't jump up and get it. And so the cat was just waiting below while the rat was clinging to this twig. And the students were watching this life and death drama being played out, and they were talking about who they thought would win the standoff. Now, most of them were betting on the cat because it was larger, quicker, more cunning, stronger, and all that stuff. But this teacher watched and said, my money would be on the rat. Because he noticed that the cat looked sleek and well-fed. And he said, for the cat, this is just another meal. For the rat, it's a matter of life and death. And after a while, the cat got bored, walked away, the rat climbed down, and scurried off. A joyful moment for the rat, and nobody felt sorry for the cat, right? <laughs> so the lesson for us to take away is that we have to look at this work as a matter of life and death, and realize that it isn't always going to be in our best interest to have someone remove the obstacles for us. I'm going to give the last words today for, uh, uh, to another, another Roman, Marcus Aurelius. He said this, he said, Our actions may be impeded, but there can be no impeding our intentions or dispositions, because we can accommodate and adapt. The mind adapts and converts to its own purposes the obstacle to our acting. The impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. Objective judgment now at this very moment. Unselfish action now at this very moment. Willing acceptance now at this very moment of all external events. That's all you need. And if I would dare say it, I think Jesus would agree. See you next week.